but I think it's big enough for everybody to see, right? Uh, automated processing of telomeres with image J and R. So this is a, an application in the short time available. I won't go into the details, but um, what we have, oh, one moment. I think I do have to make it bigger. Let's try to do this. Slideshow. Fine, just keep it this way. Um, Okay, so the problem statement. We have uh, cells, these are primary human lymphocytes. Uh, they have, uh, uh, there are theories that say that uh, uh, telomere length can be an indication, possibly a diagnostic tool. Uh, telomeres are uh, basically uh, repeats of, uh, uh, nucleotide repeats at the end of chromosomes every time, the chromo every time uh, cells uh, reproduce. The ends, you know, nature has this wonderful mechanism for reproducing its DNA, and the ends of the chromosomes don't quite make it, and then it's got a special mechanism for putting the ends back on, right? Um, uh, the ends in many cells get progressively shorter until the cells become senescent and stop dividing, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, so one of the theories that in cancer you see increased telomerase activity, and um, presumably the telomeres would get longer. On the other hand, it turns out that often cancer cells have shorter telomeres. Apparently there's this race between how fast they divide and how fast the telomeres get put back. Either way, uh, someone in, a has in uh, one of the hospitals, a mayor hospital in Karasaba, wanted to know if they could characterize telomere length, and I won't go into the details of how that's done, but there's a fluorescent probe that attaches to the repeats, and the longer the repeat, presumably the stronger the, the uh, signal. And those are the yellow dots that you see, and the blue is DAPI staining of the nucleus, and that uh, these cells have actually, uh, the cytoplasm has been stripped away. Um, so that's what you're seeing over here, and we're supposed to then measure the strength and number of these telomeres. Uh, just for your uh, aside, quantitative fluorescence microscopy is incredibly difficult to do, and uh, if you can avoid it, you know, try it. But uh, it, and if you can't avoid it, then stick with morphology and counts and things like that. But if you still can't avoid it, then bite the bullet and do the controls required to say something about intensity. Okay, so each field is three to eight cells. There are 20 to 40 fields from each slide. Four to five slides for each illness, four illnesses, and a healthy control. When you do the math, we, we're studying about 3,000 cells and you know 200,000 telomeres. Just to give you an idea, uh, there are you know uh, 46 uh, chromosomes, uh, 92 telomeres, the ends of each one. If, the, if we're in S2, I'm sorry, in uh, G2. Uh, then, uh, then those the DNA is duplicated, so there could be you know a hundred something uh, telomeres. So there's a lot of points to count. And the two students who came to me with this asked if I could help them with the image processing. They were looking into microscopes and you know click 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 and counting like that. So they weren't going to do this manually. And there's another problem too that they're not all in the same focus plane. So there's an image processing workflow which I won't. Um, We'll go into detail, but we have to segment the nuclei, segment the telomeres, count them, create a lot of data files, and then all that is dumped into R to do some uh, statistical uh, analysis. Um, acquisition of Z-stacks. Uh, okay, so I said that the telomeres are not all in the same focus plane. So um, we acquire like, you know, 17 images, and, and, uh, and uh, then uh, there is an extended depth of field plugin that will allow you to get sharp images. It took too long, though, and it turned out that maximum intensity projections work just fine. And maybe if I have a chance, I'll try out the uh, uh, Amira uh, deconvolution plugins and see if they work uh, at, in reasonable speed. But anyway, so this is an example of three different planes. And if you download the, um, the slide and you look closely at it, you'll see that each plane has different telomeres in focus. We then segment the nuclei. That's actually very easy to do. DAPI segmentations are wonderful. Um, you know, if those were the only ones I had to do, I'd be a happy camper, but probably out of business. Um, but I'm just showing that there are roundness criteria that we use to get rid of artifacts. And this particular uh, slide was nice because we also had a metaphase spread. That's what you see over here. And the metaphase spread is rejected because it's not nice and round and, and so on. So we can reject things like that. Um, 
Okay, so now we have to segment the telomeres. And again, I don't know if you can see it closely here, but there, I've marked the telomeres that we found in red. We use the maximum, uh, the find the maxima function in the process menu to find the, the telomeres after some pre-processing, and uh, then we count them. Um, so that's what this slide is showing over here. And the output then is we get a separate CSV file uh, for each cell. So we have a hierarchy of data. Each cell has its own little file that counts all the individual telomeres with their data. And then each, uh, and then we have each slide has its own set of summaries. And then each patient, its summaries. And then that's basically what's dumped into R. So we have an, uh, a manual editing step in the, in, 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 in the way. Um, it's a very nice little tool that a student wrote to uh, mark cells, which this one here is folded over on itself. This one here has some overlap from other cells. Oh, we can't count telomeres in overlapping cells because we won't get a valid count, obviously. Um, the rules of the game, if you're going to do manual editing, uh, make sure you document it and save it, like I said earlier in the morning, so that if someone comes and says, maybe you took out all the cells that just didn't uh, you know, find favor in your eyes, you know, then we can say, OK, here it is. This is what we took out, and these are the reasons we did it. We have objective criteria for doing it, so that was done. And then finally, in R, we, we uh, take all the CSV, the comma-separated um, uh, values, and we take that in and we get a nice little spread. I'm not really very good in R. I learned to use these things as necessary, so I don't have a nice box plot here and so on, but one of these days. In the meantime, this is just a spread of the data that shows a mean and standard deviations for all the different patients. P-values, P-values are wonderful things. You can prove anything you want with P-values, you know. So, so that's nice, you just to decide what your cutoff is. But um, mostly what we found out now is that the biology does not seem to in the, to be correct here, but you know I just call it like I see it. You know my job is just to make sure that the microscopy and the Im and the image processing is valid and correct. It's not my job to you know uh, uh, you know tell them that the diagnosis is going to be correct. And, you know if it, uh, it turns out that these are spread all over the place, and there are many good biological reasons why uh, telomere lengths are going to vary all over the band, even in a healthy person, like the fact that the lymphocytes live for about uh, three to six, three to four months, and the telomere lengths are going to gradually shorten during that time, right? So, so there's going to be a whole spread depending on the length of them. Nevertheless, it's at least we got the measurement right, and that's good because there are a lot of people who study uh, telomeres, and uh, they would like to be able to make these measurements reasonably. Okay, so in 10 minutes, there's not much I can do. I will just add, first of all, thanks to the people who did all the biology, Aliza Miel at Mayor Hospital, uh, the two students who actually prepared all the slides, and also a summer student who did some of the uh, Python programming for me that bridged between image J and R. And the other thing I will say is that now that I heard this morning's talk on Jan's speckle analyzer, much of what we spent about six months writing could probably be done much more easily with his speckle analyzer, and that's one of the good reasons for coming to conferences like these so that you actually learn about uh, about these tools that people are that people have made up cell profiler is also supposed to be appropriate for this kind of work though I did try using a little bit I ran into some problems linking it to Fiji on the Macintosh but if I had been invested in getting it to work under cell profiler I'm sure I could have done that also you know it's, but I have the expertise in Fiji so that's what I used and that's all I can tell you in 10 minutes. So uh, if you're interested in the tools that we use, there's some of the code snippets that were necessary to do some of this and go through all the uh, regions of interest and the hierarchy of data. You can just write to me or speak to me. I'll be happy to share those with you. That's it. All right, thank you.